I appreciate being assigned this topic because, frankly, I'm, I'm passionate about it. I think this, this really uh, gives the spine surgeon an opportunity to move into the anterior column in a, in a good, safe, and productive way. At the same time, I really appreciate the plurality of thought today. And I, so I'm going to start this by just saying I firmly believe that as, as spine surgeons, we want to develop a toolbox where we have multiple tools to be used in multiple uh, uh, situations. And having said that, we're going to focus for just a few minutes here on anterior column work with an oblique approach. And, and, and uh, if uh, Dr. Lieberman doesn't get too upset with me, I'm going to tell you some reasons why I think it's... Uh, I'm gonna I'm, I'll give you some thoughts on why I think this, this may be uh, the evolution, getting back to Dr. McConnell's slide on the, uh, the, the uh, ape moving to a man, the evolution of uh, anterior inner body work. So uh, the slide that Dr. Bourbon showed just outlines all our options to get into the inner body space. And for a moment, I would like to take the uh, idea that, that this right here may be our most our, our safest and most effective way to get into the inner body space because we're not going to work past the fecal sac. We're not going to make uh, tartar out of the psoas muscle by going straight through it. And we're not going to take all of these components that the Lord placed up here to keep our brains alive and, and retract them out of the way. We're going to use gravity to retract the peritoneal contents when we do an OLIF, and we're not going to be sticking a large... Uh, diva retractors in and such to to mobilize those peritoneal contents. So, uh, what just first of all, what are some of the upsides? We're, I, I, I'm going to have this. We're going to focus really on some cases, but let's just talk for a moment uh, uh, didactically on what are some of the upsides to uh, uh, working anterior to the psoas. Well, for those of us that kind of went from a lift surgeons to direct lateral surgeons. The advantage is we take the lumbar plexus out of play. We move anterior to the psoas in a way that the iliac crest no longer dictates that we can't get to L5-S1 or that we're going to struggle at L4-5. Uh, our end plate preparation is dramatically improved from, certainly from direct lateral surgery because of our exposure, our increased exposure. So we can easily visualize a disc, remove it, and uh, I like what... Um, uh, case mentioned earlier, I view this almost as a, a large ACDF with, from the oblique approach with blood that runs out of the field. You can look to the back of the disc space and really get a good direct decompression, not just an indirect decompression. We'll talk a little bit about do, do we want to use multiple incisions or one incision. Again, getting back to Dr. Lieber Lieberman's uh, uh, point earlier. Uh, and, and then, the, you know, direct. Decompression is a real thing. I know there are some surgeons that argue against it. Um, I, the Pimenta really did a compelling body of work looking at, at what can be achieved with direct decompression. And I'll just say that it, uh, while I still agree with Dr. Bourbon, direct decompression is not applicable to every case, every patient. Uh, so again, this OLIF procedure should be one more tool, important tool in your, in your toolbox. And then one of the things that, that I've I've kind of evolved to is, is no longer neuromonitoring the spine during the oblique approach because when we work into the, to the psoas, we take the lumbar plexus out of play, and what that is allowing is less abdominal wall dissection. By getting the anesthesiologist to relax the abdominal wall, uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to have to uh, uh, work. We don't work as hard to, to manipulate the, the abdominal wall. It's less pain and less uh, post-op uh, uh, problems. So in this, in this age of the virus, I'm going to give you this to, to just to think uh, and chew on today, the RSV. What, what, is, what is something that, that, that the OLIF can deliver to my practice that, um, that doing a traditional supine ALIF or doing a trans procedure in the direct lateral position can't do? So RSV, resiliency, simplicity, and versatility, just to help you remember. In terms of simplicity, working into the psoas, I mean, you're... Your dissection in the lateral decubitus position uh, is much easier than a traditional supine alif. Much less work, and that less work just equates to less uh, trauma on the peritoneal contents. Uh, versatility. This is an operation 
that when you begin the procedure with the patient in the lateral position, you can certainly stage that patient, doing your anterior work one day, posterior work on another. You can flip the patient, just like in the case of a traditional A-lift, re repositioning the patient prone, doing your open work or pedicle screws. Or this patient may be somebody that they have a stable L5-S1 segment. Uh, you can do anterior standalone uh, uh, surgery. So, so the versatility of the OLIF uh, is, is something to be considered. And then finally, resiliency. The, these patients bounce back quickly. And, it, and um, it isn't the most important thing, but it is an important thing to that patient that, that gets back up on their feet on the day of surgery, and, and many of which will walk out of the hospital on the day after surgery. Not because I'm pushing them out, just because they're ready to go. So let's look at a few cases. And um, in fact, what, what I might try to do, Pierce, is move through these cases quickly. And then if we want to pull them back up on the board for a panel discussion, we can. This is a, a, a young female athlete. Uh, she's a high-level athlete and a high-demand patient. And we all know those patients. They can be challenging, especially when they show up with pathology that's challenging as well. But there's no wrong answer here in terms of how to approach this. This is certainly a case that, that can be treated with a T-lif. This is a case, case that can be treated with a traditional supine A-lif. Or you can use a, a direct lateral transolus procedure in a single position to, to treat this. But uh, sometimes the best operation for a patient is the operation that you do best as a surgeon. And in this case, I chose to, uh, to treat this lady, young lady with an O-lif procedure and reducing this case in a single position. And I, was, I think you can see I'm, I'm pleased with my reduction. Uh, I'm pleased with my fixation. And clinically, she has made steady progress since this operation. They've really done quite well. So I just put two sections of slides here showing the, the intraoperative floral films and then films about a year after surgery. This does bring up that subject uh, case that I, I mentioned earlier. I am curious, should I be placing these cages as anterior as possible right behind the ALL, or should I be placing these cages posteriorly in a way to get good posterior distraction? Would love to have more discussion on that subject later because I do think you can get more segmental lordosis with an anteriorly placed cage. Let's look at another uh, uh, case. Just, this just focused on simplicity. In this case, you just see a, a kind of a, a, a bread and butter degenerative case where a disc is completely worn out. The anatomic disc space has been lost and is, is crying to just be restored in order to give this patient uh, relief of their neurogenic claudication. And in, that, in this case, it's exactly uh, what I did, did, doing a similar procedure to the last one. But here, just restoring this, this inner body space, doing posterior instrumentation. Again, in this situation with the patient in single position. I would highlight something that Dr. Bourbon pointed out earlier. Sometimes when this, when you have significant reactive tissue, either to a high-grade slip or chronically uh, a long-standing degenerative condition, this, this uh, uh, tissue that's in the spinal canal can only be cleared with the posterior procedure. And so I, I'm taking a little bit different approach than what you've heard today from, from some of these other guys. I tell people we may need to go back and do a mini open but what we're going to try is to maintain your paraspinous musculature, minimize your blood loss with the understanding that if you don't get the relief of your low extremity symptoms that you need, we'll go back and do a mini open decompression. And for, it just in terms of my thinking, I, I, I like that flow. I like where we're moving there right now. Uh, how does the OLIF procedure give me uh, versatility in my practice? Well, w with patients with more than one problem, it just allows me to... Um, to direct that, uh, to direct their care, oops, excuse me, uh, in this case. So here, there should be a video that I can run. Uh, uh, any IT person in the room? This patient just has a large, if you look off uh, on the actual image, you see this patient has just a, a massive extruded disc fragment that's behind the L4 vertebral body. And sometimes, under direct vision, you can see and pull that disc out from the front with the patient in the lateral decubitus position, but sometimes you can't. And so in this case, 
the patient, we, we flipped the patient, did our posterior instrumentation in a prone position, and then with a third incision, did a mini open and retrieved this uh, extruded disc from the, the canal behind the L4 body. So this is just a, an example of the versatility that the OLIF is gonna, is gonna offer you. Uh, and just another uh, two-level procedure. And then finally, so th this brings into the, the play the, the cases that uh, you heard Dr. Lieberman, Dr. Bourbon talked about earlier. How do we address these, these you know, geriatric uh, deformity cases? Since sometimes the deformity is just in the form of a lack of lumbar lordosis or lumbar kyphosis, but these patients are struggling, and, and we need to find a way that takes into account their, their needs as a 70, 80 year old person uh, in a way that it hurts them the, the least amount possible. So I did not include any cases in here the, that are thoracal lumbar. All of these are, are pan lumbar cases. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a couple of them. And it, it, this is just a nice option. Uh, these are the cases that I do reposition. So, so lateral decubitus position, multi-level ALIFs, with uh, from an oblique anterior to psoas approach. Um, I am still working either under the ribs or between the ribs. I'm not resecting any rib at this point, but you'll see I, I'm using a uh, at T12, L1, L12. I'll typically use a parallel cage. I think it's the most effective way to reestablish that thoracolumbar transition. Uh, but in not being afraid in these cases that when we flip, um, if I'm concerned that what we're gonna do is reestablish enough lordosis that that patient's brain is not gonna handle it and fall off the top, extend that ins instrumentation up to T10. And just another little bit. And finally, just one more thought on the versatility of the OLIF. It does give you the opportunity to do single position surgery. So when you, when you complete the anterior portion of the procedure, your assistant can be closing the front of the, the abdomen and uh, you can be starting your perk screws in the back. It's not the right procedure for everybody, and certainly if sagittal restoration and lordosis is critical to getting a good outcome in that patient, you're gonna wanna reposition them, use gravity as your assistant to improve your uh, lumbar lordosis. But it's, this is a very effective tool in your toolbox uh, to help with efficiency in the OR, minimizing the patient's time under anesthetic, and saving your hospital some money. So in conclusion, I, we're really talking about L5 and up, but th one of the prime advantages of the OLIF procedure is to be able to access L5-S1. And I agree with Dr. McConnell, in L5-S1, even though it's an oblique approach, it's really just a traditional ALIF. Take down the ALL com completely, bilateral frame anatomies using a small curved curette, and, and uh, typically taking down the, the posterior longitudinal ligament with a curette, uh, just as Dr. Bourbon described earlier. There's less, in fact, I don't even find the lumbar plexus coming into play. If, pe if, if we do you know, three, four, five level O lifts, so we've not trashed the, the psoas muscle, but we are retracting it. People may have some weakness in that, their, their hip flexor, but it's not neuro neurogenic weakness. It's just, just for manipulating the muscle, it comes back in a day or two, not in six to 12 months, like we see when we have lumbar plexus injuries. Uh, outstanding visualization and plate prep, uh, end plate prep, and and disc uh, uh, fusion bed development. Fantastic indirect decompression as well as direct decompression, um, and and I would argue that it's probably less morbid than supine traditional ALIF surgery, and less morbid than transsoas surgery. Thanks. First of all. Um, sometimes I think that uh, Dan likes me for comic relief. There's been some, such good, great presentations. I'm always humble when I'm around all these smart people because I'm just an old country spine surgeon from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Um, how do we advance this? That button? Yep, that didn't do it. Y'all have to help me. I had cataract surgery. I went from one pair of glasses to three pair of glasses. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, I'm showing you this first. How do I start it? And I'm helpless, obviously. The reason that I'm showing you this largely is because I'm a narcissist and I like showing off. But there'll get to be a point about this in a second. John's gonna, John's gonna, where's John? There you go, you're gonna cringe. 
this was a couple of months ago, and this was a, uh, now understand this is a world record squat for old fat men in this one federation, <laughs> okay? Big boys don't squat that weight, that was just 320 pounds. But the reason that I'm showing that is um, almost two years ago, John operated on me and uh, he calls me his spinal annuity. Um, so anyway, that's why we do this, is to get our patients back to doing what they want to do and need to do. Um, did you tell me to do that? Oh, no, no. Understand, th this, I'm going to give a disclaimer here. I did nothing John told me to do after surgery. I got lucky. But, um, but anyway, so shout out to John for that. I also do appreciate you showing the slide and the other gentleman showing the slide of the Neanderthal to the upright because that's me. I've been doing this 35 years. I put in Harrington rods. So we made a, a lot of progress. Lateral case data, um, if it was not for the better anterior approaches and in instrumentation we have now, the level number would be significantly higher than that. But to date, I've done 752 levels. Average retractor time, which I think is the most important thing when it comes to lateral surgery. Um, if you are on about your 50th lateral and your retractor time is 30 minutes, you need to find a different approach. And it's not that you're a bad surgeon, um, but this is one time where efficiency and speed is so important. Average skin to skin is 28 minutes. Now what you're not gonna hear me say in the next eight minutes is this is the best way to do this. Lateral approach for me is the best way to fuse the spine when I get above wherever I've done A lifts. For me, it works. If O lift works for you, great. Maybe sometime I'll let John show me how to do an O lift. I may be in here and you're presenting my O lift data. I don't know. Um, this first case is a woman that presented to me. She'd seen two other neurosurgeons. I'm a neurosurgeon, but I'm actually more of a wannabe orthopedic surgeon. Um, she presented with a history of back pain for 20 years. She was 45 years old, not osteopenic, healthy. She exercised every day. She'd already done everything possible, and she had been told, well, there's nothing we can do for you. Um, she had multi-level degenerative disc disease. I think this probably was a degenerative uh, scoliosis, not a congenital. At that age, sometimes it's hard to tell, but she certainly has a significant amount of degeneration. No significant stenosis a lot of facet arthropathy. Well, what I did was put in a lot of hardware. And sometimes when I show these things, I get a little embarrassed. But, and the most important thing you do, is this the laser pointer in the middle or am I gonna screw something up again? Um, you gotta make sure your rods are straight where it looks like you've completely corrected the scoliosis, which obviously it's, well, it's not bad. Um, there. Um, the first day, I put in two ends in the bottom two discs. Um, I did the right side up, which is my favorite way to approach the spine, solely because I'm right-handed. Um, if there's a reason to, which I did feel like that at the upper levels there was, we went in the left side. So on the second day, I went on the left side, did spire implants with lateral plating, and then put in about unilateral screws up where the, the most the most significant point of scoliosis was, and then screws all the way down to the sacrum. Um, she's a year out now, she's doing great. I'm gonna have to fuse her SI joint, which is not uncommon. I think a lot of our old uh, uh, failures of fusion weren't really failures of fusion. We were changing mechanical back pain into SI joint pain. Now we've got good ways to fix it. Um, so it's a lot of instrumentation. She did great. Does that mean I'm a great surgeon? Well, not really. I can't remember who said this. It was at a Society of Lateral Access Surgery meeting about, oh gosh, 10 years ago. And I was on a panel like this and we were talking about, can I say the word X lift? Is that okay, uh, Dan? Can I say it? Yeah. We were talking about X lifts and, um, and a guy said this, just because we have the technology to correct coronal plane imbalance does not make us all deformity surgeons. And some of you, are trained and excellent deformity surgeons. I've learned my lesson. If I have a 65, 70 year old lady who has bad degenerative scoliosis, I send her down to Little Rock where there's a scoliosis surgeon. If I've got this lady, 
then I'd do it because I've learned the lesson the hard way. Um, I'm not a deformity surgeon, um, but in that case, it worked out well. The second case, um, this patient presented to me. She was 65 years old. Really, just looking at it, not that bad osteopenic. Her, her bone density was fine. She had presented to another neurosurgeon about an hour and a half away with back pain and a little bit of ambulatory leg pain. And I'm embarrassed to say this guy actually trained. He was two years ahead of me in training, which the earth was cooling, and I always feel like I'm the oldest guy here. But, um, but he did a channel laminectomy. And guess what? Her back pain got worse. She's hyperlordotic. Coronal plane balance is not that bad, but she said, what can you do? Well, she also had, well, I guess I don't have that slide. She had a large recurrence at 4-5, and I said, well, is your leg pain your main problem? She said, no, it's my back pain. I said, well, then going in and taking that disc out is going to do no good whatsoever. I told her she needed to have a fusion if she wanted to, and she did. Um, honestly, the real reason I'm showing you that, that's the 500th NSA A that I put in. I told you I was going to sneak that in, Beth. Um, then I did uh, lateral spira. I could not, the pedicle at L2 was tiny. And I typically do cortical screws now, especially in osteopenic people. <laughs> the rod, fortunately I've quit bending my own rods. I've got a really strong scrub that I, I put the little thing down and template it and then I go sit down for about 10 minutes. Um, unilateral construct, posterior clamp, don't know if that was needed or even helps. Um, and this patient's weight, oh, I even snuck that in. Well, sorry about that, Beth. There she is. Uh, there's my team. So you can see it takes a universe for most people, uh, or it takes a village for most people. It takes a universe for me. Um, but she's doing well, but she's only a month out. How's she going to do long term? I don't know. I'm mainly showing it just to show off it was the 500 Finza. Um, peak cages. Does anybody in here still use peak cages for any inner body? Yes. It's okay. Okay, that's a great answer. See, what, what, what I did was, is, what I did was before, it, before it became illegal is I built my own hospital. Um, so anyway, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying, I promise. Uh, since I've gone to titanium cages, my subsidence has, has dropped dramatically from uh, where, let's show that in a second. I've had, why? I don't know. You know, for years I thought, I never used titanium, and now everything I use is titanium. It's harder. It shouldn't, you shouldn't have subsidence. But it is dramatic, the decrease on the A-lift implants when I used to use titanium implants in the, in the laterals, a dramatic drop. Using, since I've gone to the titanium cages, um, on subsidence, I've had 1.4%. I did have one traumatic fracture that I, was just not my fault. And there were two osteoporotic patients out of the three. Early on, I had two bowel injuries, one vascular injury. Now, those were in the first 100 of the 700 levels I did. And I tell my patients that. You know, if you're a mechanic, are you better now than you were 20 years ago? Um, honestly, this should not happen. This was a younger, more cavalier surgeon not taking his time. Um, the vascular injury was just a patient that had multiple surgeries. N and this is recent data. Uh, it used to be higher, again, with titanium or with the uh, peak implants. I don't know why. Uh, but now I have about 5% transient hip flexor weakness. It's almost always resolved in the first month. I have had one permanent hip flexor weakness, which if you look at 700 levels, you're going to say he's bullshitting you. Um, and the answer is I probably am because I am a private practice surgeon and we can look back on data and see. So, why do I do it? Whatever approach you're most comfortable with that has the best results while establishing sagittal coronal plane alignments, the way to go. If that's O lift, great. I'm not gifted enough to do it from behind. Um, but I do think the anterior column's where, it's, where it is. So what I do, when I get above, when I get above the, wherever I'm stopping with my A lift, which is usually three, four, I've done up to two, three, then I'll go laterally. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
thank you. Thank you for allowing me to share this podium, if you will, with some very notable and esteemed colleagues. And I'm sure you, none of you have heard of me, other than a few that I've trained with and work with. But uh, thank you. And thank you, IMSC, for allowing this opportunity. So um, I was asked to kind of share the growth process, why I opened my, my mind to OLEF, how does this integrate, um, where I started, where I came from. So I'll buzz through. Um, a lot of the things that we've already heard and shared and experienced, I feel the same way. But I'll go ahead and felt like I need to put my headgear on before I came up. But so I'm not, I'm not afraid to share a punch. So here we go. Um, I am a T-Lift guy. Been a T-Lift guy. It's how I trained. It's okay. <laughs> it's all good. But back to, you know, what works for you? What can you get your correction? How can you make your patients better with, with what you hold? Um, I trained with a guy that back in the late 90s kind of said, hey, I think we need to describe how we knock out the facet to put our cages in through the foramen without getting all the traction neuropathies. You should write this up. <laughs> and I said, hmm, wow. Maybe. <laughs> Back to work, right? So Plifts kind of moved out. t lift stepped in. That's what I got good at. Got into private practice. I currently practice in Clearwater, Florida, which is kind of what we refer to as God's waiting room. So we have a, a lot of special con considerations that we need to take into account when we start, you know, looking into these cases. So uh, we do, I wish I could say I put in as many indices, but I probably take 500 bites with my kerosene per case. So it's, we're more of a decompression community, but clearly um, have a lot of instability that we have to deal with. So T-lifts, so when I started practice, I started developing these minimally invasive T-lifts and really just came to the realization that I have a single level grade two degenerative spondy at L4-5, but I got a shitload of stenosis at 3-4 and 5-1. So I was like, I gotta decompress them, and I gotta do good decompressions, because there's extensive central and lateral recess stenosis and a ton of foraminal stenosis, as you know, typically at the, at the olisthesis level. So that's what I evolved to, just a little mini kind of open, but decompressed side to side, top to bottom, as far as I felt like I need to go. And then uh, dropped a cage in, and then closed that and put in percutaneous screws and made a way to decorticate the posterior, last, posterior lateral osseous structures and drop in some bone graft and move on, because I had tons of it from the local decompression. But then the A-lift, D-lift, X-lift, E-I-E-I-O lifts came out, and I'm like, man, I just don't know. You know, I'm a private practice guy, solo. You know, I don't have good vascular support and exposure guys. I, you know, I really didn't, maybe it was a little premature. I should have been a little more open-minded, and, but I sat at a, at a conference, and a very astute colleague that we all know, I won't share his name because he's not here, it was like, yeah, my patients wake up with, you know, about 90% of them wake up with leg pain on the contralateral side when I do the, the X lifts and D lifts, but don't worry, it goes away. I'm like, man, I'm in a small community. I can't have that running around the, you know, the social bees. So I was like, all right, I'm going to stick with what I'm doing. Uh, it was working and, and we were doing it. So then um, I even forgot how I got brought up, but I got introduced to the good Dr. Williams and, and to... The point he made earlier, it was, um, he's like, consider OLIF. I'm like, all right, I'll consider it. But in the meantime, we're cranking this out. You know, and to your point, I was like draping these people over a Wilson frame, made my decompression or, uh, better, easier, faster. And then I could put my cage in. I could reduce the Wilson frame, restore my lordosis, blah, blah, blah. We were moving along, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of the same things. Um, but when Dr. Williams shared, this is like a giant ACDF. I'm like, I love necks. They do well. <laughs> you can do your decompression. You can do a fusion. You can get them out same day, next day. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. So that was a, a good reason to consider because 21 years in practice, all these lengthy decompressions I've been doing, they're starting to settle. They're starting to get some post-laminectomy instability. So there's really no central stenosis but you can see the three or four millimeters of instability. Why not? Let's, let's look at this. Let's, let's consider this. So I felt like I need to kind of do, do something better for my patients. I wanted to stay mainstream. My SIG fellow just, just came into town. I'm like, whoa, I got I to gotta step up my game, right? I'm not going to be the old guy. 
So, uh, and then, <laughs> in all honesty, let me just, so we're opening our, our joint and spine hospital uh, next week. So I was like, here's a great opportunity to take care of these folks and, you know, we can keep them overnight and that's kind of what I've been seeing. The, the dozen, two dozen that we've done, they've all gone home the next morning except one. So I was like, hmm. So I was like, how do I do this? I couldn't do it without the IMSC camber support. Um, you know, I've, <laughs> I tagged Brooke at, Brooks McAdam in this. Instrumental, uh, the retractor systems, the, the cadaver labs that you have access to, Dr. Williams, Dr. McConnell, they're just the two that I single out just because they helped me through it, through this process. I got to fly to Indiana and, and uh, see Dr. Williams work, amazing. Team was amazing. Dr. Williams came down to see me, and we're just combing through cases. He actually scrubbed in with me at my hospital, and we did uh, book three cases. Here's, here's, how I, here's how I went in after I went to the labs, went to work with him in, um, in Indiana, booked three cases. First two, boom, boom. First one was really tough. Um, second one went really well, but there was a long delay between turnover. Imagine that. Um, so the third one, he's like, how you feeling? So I feel pretty good. He goes, good, because I got a plane to catch. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, <laughs> I had to go change my scrubs. But <laughs> I was like, you know, he was like, I'll change, I'll change. I'm like, no, 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 no. I think we got this. It's all good. She was a um, well-established patient of mine. She weighed about 100 pounds soaking wet and thin and just good anatomy. Everything was just I was like, all right, I got this, I got this. So but anyway, nevertheless, that was a, that was a, um, that was a cardiac stress test. So we, uh, we did it, we pulled it off, everything's great. Um, so I, this is, you know, I set mine up a little bit different. So for me, it was just a process of evolution. Um, again, not, I do less of these than I do anything, honestly, but I'm a biplanar fluoroscopy guy. That was another big hang up. I'm like, I'm not a, you know, I, I want to be able to do single position surgery, you know, if it's indicated. I want, I want to keep moving. I got to keep my day going, et cetera. So I was able to integrate the biplanar fluoroscopy, uh, single position surgery. That was key for me. Um, and then I get this one. <laughs> this is one that I just did. Um, I have since, I did the, my first few cases, oddly enough, without an access surgeon. For those of you who aren't doing these, it's not the end of the world. It's not bad if you select the right patient um, because it literally is a giant ACDF. But now I have transitioned over to an access surgeon for more cases than not. And the reason for me is it's just a, a comfort level. It's, in the, it's a speed, not speed per se, that comes out you know, inappropriate. But it's just doing the right thing so we can kind of move through two rooms. Um, and I don't mind you know, sharing that, that glory with, with an access surgeon, and it's a, it's a comfortable situation to be in. So anyway, um, this one I did have, we did this last week, um, lady had these 25-year-old VSP plates in and um, slipped above, pretty clear cut, not a tremendous amount of central stenosis, lateral recess stenosis. I didn't include her flexion, ex flexion extension films, but you know, she was that one that's moving. Was very well established. I thought this is such a great case between that, you know, just any of your psoas, I, perfect. So we did it and it was, I mean, he literally had me down on the disc in about 12 to 13 minutes. Just, just easy. I come in, I do my part. I put this one up because I don't think this is something that I could have accomplished with my T-lift. I just don't think I could, because she had this asymmetric disc base collapse. That part of the annulus had calcified, and it was really stuck down. And I knew that once I started trying to put the trial in. It's the smallest trial there is. It was tethered, and it, there was so much tension, it just wanted to spit the trial out. And so that's why I put this in, because after I ran that cob across and released the annulus on the other side, I was completely able to restore um, or get the reduction I wanted, get that posterior disc space elevated, and then this is one that I flipped and took the plates out through two paramedian incisions and just dropped screws in. That's what we did. Um, so I just thought that was a good one. Another one that I find is, is super helpful, and there was a slide earlier with the, the back fat was about six inches deep, eight inches deep. Well, this is a guy we did last week. 
BMI, uh, uh, excuse me, 118 kilograms. <laughs> big, big boy. And had, uh, we just, I felt like the corridor was right. I felt like it was just a good, a good patient for it. Um, with all that muscle relaxation, the belly just fought, felt right out of the way. Two blade system, we could even, you know, put a third in, but didn't need to. Had great visualization. Another option, and this is where I'll probably get punched, but um, uh, this, is, this is actually um, the, one of the ladies that I did a long time ago, clearly with peak cages, um, and the degeneration process just took over at L5-S1, had a little retrolisthesis, and I said, you know, and now she's up mid to late 70s, but again, 89, 90 pounds, 100 pounds, she's tiny. I was concerned about just doing it, you know, standalone. And I told her where my concerns were and followed her and followed her all the way to a year out. She's a year out now and is doing fine. But she was, <laughs> bad to say, but she pushed me not to go to the back and take all those rods out and, and extend her fusion down. So anyway, uh, maybe I got away with that one. I want to thank you guys. Um, so, so, so as a person who has yet to come over the O-lift bridge, uh, and who, who does not do O-lifts in the room, does not do them, surgeon-wise? Yeah, so, so the struggle that we've had, and again, I've done my own uh, approaches in the past. I was trained to do them for about a year. I did my own. John's a wizard at them. Um, but uh, we just, comfortability, we have an access guy. And so the access guy uh, even did a training, but he's just, his issue is, if you get a contralateral vein lack, what the hell are we going to do? I mean, you got to get two, you know, I, I mean, when we get vein problems, we get them. It's great if we've got four eyeballs and four hands, and so somebody holds control, and we usually, we never lose more than, you know, 20 to 50 cc's hardly because we're on it. But that could be 500, 600 a liter if you don't get on it. So what do you say to us to get us over the edge of, you know, it's great when things go well, but what happens when they don't? John, you want to take that first? Sure, because, you know, um, well, I haven't let my hair down with all you guys, but I have with Pierce. He knows I've had every complication under the sun. And you're going to have vein injuries if you work anterior to the lumbar spine at L5-S1. Um, I've never seen an injury on the contralateral side right now. And, and maybe uh, to Dr. McConnell's comment earlier, maybe that's why I'm a big believer in approaching from the left. The, the big danger, because as the left common iliac vein is fleeing the surgical space to go down the left lower extremity, it's in play more so than the right side. So I always leave the right-sided vessels on, as my contralateral side and could just develop a little soft tissue envelope and place that homer blade on the patient's right. I've never seen a, I've never seen a right-sided injury. Um, on the left side, then you, so you're gonna have to retract that left iliac vein out of harm's way and gravity's working against you there. So it's, it's critical that you mobilize it bluntly, start on the sacrum, work up onto the annulus, be looking diligently for the middle sacral vessels because if one's hiding underneath that left common iliac where it falls down by the gravity, and you retract on it, that's where you're going to get your injury. You're going to get a, you're going to a tear in middle sacral off the bifurcation or off the left common leg. So be looking for those middle sacral vessels, find them, uh, uh, cauterize them with the bipolar, ligate them, and then mobilize those stubs with the endokitner. Uh, but if, if you do have a bad lead, I, two th I do two things. One is I've got a vascular guy I have a good relationship with, and in my experience, I've had to call him twice. And he's come in and, and is, is he on standby or you just hope he's not doing a triple A? He, yeah, <laughs> he's not on standby any longer uh, because I, I mean, I could hold, I could be the little Dutch boy and hold my finger in the dike if I had to, you know. Um, uh, I, I've not lost a patient doing this, Pierce. So I'm, I'm, I feel very confident that this is a procedure that could be done safely. And I, I get your access guys can concern. If you have a problem, how do you expand this, this uh, exposure? I do think there's ways to do that by opening the, you know, basically you could take that fascial incision and turn it into a, a nephrectomy incision if you needed to and really get at the vasculature. 
uh, uh, still using the lateral corridor, the lateral abdominal wall, staying out of the rectus corridor. Do you do any straight A lifts anymore, supine A lifts? So I do believe having every tool in the toolbox is important. The only traditional supine A lift I've done in the last year is helping one of my partners do one that believes in it. I, I don't do any on my own anymore. I, I, I am so, uh, and I'm listening hard when these guys that, that I really respect to talk about the benefits of traditional supine A lifts and positioning people prone. Right here, Polstra and Bourbon talk about it. I'm listening hard. Uh, but the discectomy and decompression you can do in the oblique position, uh, I'm just too impressed with. And I'm very pleased with the, with the sagittal balance I'm getting. And I don't hesitate to take down the ALL if I need to at L4-5 and then put a, uh, just an interference screw in to make sure that it, that, that cage can't move. Excellent. So let's go to Arkansas. So <laughs> let's talk a little bit about lateral because I think lateral is still here. It's still here to stay, and I think there's a lot of technology. Um, do you go, Dr. Blanchard, do you go direct um, – uh, uh, or, or rather uh, percutaneous, or are you docking short or uh, visualizing at all going through the psoas? What's, what's, what's your technique and what are your thoughts about now, that? The, uh, my technique is basically with the exception of the two incisions that I never understood why Luis came up with that. Uh, I went to, even abandoned I that. went to Las Vegas and uh, Bill Smith showed me his one incision and I said, okay, now I see the uh, there pop and you're in. Um, I, I do a straight lateral. In most situations, I'll use single incisions for each level. It's the only thing that I do. Of course, Nuvasiv came up with this maximal access term because they want it to be special. But um, it is the one thing that I still do minimally invasive. I've kind of gotten away from that. I've found my patients do just as well. Maybe I'm getting old and my eyesight's bad and I, I need to have bigger incisions. I don't know. But for that, I still will go with a, a fairly small incision. Now, you have to understand, I don't have any 100-pound patients soaking wet. Uh, <laughs> Northwest Arkansas, if my patient weighs under 200 pounds, I've got the easiest day I've had in a, in a month. Um, but laterally, it doesn't matter as much because the, the, the belly generally falls away. So I'll do a straight lateral approach. I will do finger section down to the psoas. Um, then once I've, I've penetrated that little fascial sheath over the psoas with my finger, I try not to get my meat, well, they're actually small, but I try not to do too much dissection. I've gone back to using the Maxis 4 retractor. I think the Nevasive retractor, they've been at it the longest in the business. It's a great retractor. Um, I dilate. We have direct monitoring. I don't use Nevasives anymore. Get it docked, and then get the surgery done and get the hell out of there. Um, now, I will tell you, I'm a little embarrassed when I realized I played it all those levels because it looks like slides I've made fun of people before. I'm not sure why I did that on that patient, but uh, I'll plate sometimes. Sometimes I won't, and that patient I probably didn't need to. Have you ever had uh, planing, uh, have you ever had a plate uh, cause a, a fracture through the vertebral body? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Especially, well, yeah, I actually have even with the, the, newer, the uh, titanium plates, I have. Question. I'm, you know, when I first came up here, they said, you're an A-lift surgeon. And I said, no, I'm an anterior column surgeon. Um, now, again, I started out being trained to do a uh, basically Ralph Cloward, who did beautiful fusions because he prepared the end plates. It's a technique that, and I'm glad that John pointed that out. It's, it, we think we clean the end plates out. It, I'm glad that you did a study to show us that even in great hands, we don't as well as we think we do. But the reason is, is I think it is important to establish that, 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 that sagittal plane balance. But more importantly, with the lateral, the thing that you get with the lateral that you don't get with an A-lift, I don't think you get with an O-lift, is you don't get that biopophyseal connection with your implant. And that's the hardest piece of bone that's in that vertebral body. So the reason I do it is to rest to restore the the foramenal height, and and for alignment's sake, um, could I do it from behind? I could, 
in my hands, it takes me longer. So uh, one thing I wanted to share was uh, I had, uh, doing a minimally invasive, um, hit an aberrant segmental, and um, that was a really touchy situation where I had to, you know, kind of open the patient, call the partner. We only ended up losing four, uh, about 400 cc's of blood, which starting with an incision this big and, and again, trying to put a dike on it. So it, but that actually caused me to change my technique about a year ago, and I got some custom right angle retractors, and I go down and visualize and see and visualize through the soils. At first, it took me a little longer. Now it adds maybe three or four minutes, maybe five minutes. But I'll go down and, and I'll go through the soas and I'll look north and south and make sure everything's clear. Since I started doing that, I've, uh, I've ligated uh, three or four vessels that I know have been there in the past and I just got lucky. Um, and so I, I would just say to, 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 to that point that if people are uneasy about that, you can you can direct visualize through a lateral approach with with um, and I can tell tell you about the customer tractors, but it it doesn't cause a lot of extra distraction, and that's that's a way to to potentially be safe in that. I was at a Solus meeting a thousand years ago, and and one guy actually brought up that he docked anterior to the right on the so as and dissected through it, and basically everybody there made fun of it. Now, as you know, if you're up around two, three, and three, four where the psoas thins out, that retractor is almost always extra psoas. So I have dissected through that, and once I do, you're right. You find things that you don't expect to find there, and you get much better mobilization of the psoas with less trauma. Um, I'm just I, too set in my ways to, but maybe I'll try it. There you go. So Dr. Davids, here's a good, quick question. Yeah, go ahead. Just two questions to uh, Yeah. from T-Lift because I, when I went back and really looked critically at a lot of my T-Lifts, it, it almost invariably you lose whatever lordosis you've gotten on the table. Those cages, depending upon footprint size, just subsided into the implants. They just melt away into the implants. And, it, it, and, it, and you go back and look at a series of films over years with these patients, you'll see that you've lost that lordosis. Um, and so that, that's another reason why I kind of evolved from the, from the T-Lift world. It doesn't matter how you the other question is, um, looking back on your T lifts, and maybe it's a little bit, uh, a little bit too premature to compare, but um, uh, junctional problems, right? We all see these people who've had T lifts. They're all coming into your office every day. They've had a T lift. You can see that they haven't really got the lordosis at L45. Now they're broken down at L34. Is it because of the lack of lordosis, or is it because of the posterior approach and the violation of the set and, and, and uh, denervation of muscle for, through, a, through a big open procedure? Changing that by doing O lift, A lift, and perk screws. So, Dr. Davis? Well, <laughs> Jeff, maybe my patients aren't living long enough to have junctional issues. I don't know. But no, but fair enough. I think it's a fair question. So, I think back to the disc space preparation uh, is key. Um, for me, you know, having the bone density test pre op on all of them is, is pivotal. Um, don't know if it changes, you know care per se. I just think you're just kind of unveiling the, the potential monster. Uh, but yeah, definitely trying to preserve that subchondral bone as much as you can. I mean, I will put my cages in transversely across the disc space. Um, as far as, yeah, I don't think you can beat, you know, these lateral cages. I, I mean, from ring to ring is, is the best bone and that's, you can't argue that. Um, in the older population, one of the things I really thought about was how do I preserve the tension band, right? And I mean, I, back in the day when we were just stripping all the way out to the tip of the TP and destroying that neurovascular bundle, um, I felt created more atrophy and more muscle damage and scar tissue, which put us at greater risk of that junctional level. That's just kind of the way I was looking at it. I just, yes, I see it be a line of it, I told you I didn't, I will always kind of minimize the surgery that I do, meaning um, I'm not doing three, four, five 
level inner body fusions, I just don't think my folks would accommodate it. Uh, therefore, you know, if I do see something that requires that, I'm not, I'm not afraid to send it, you know, across the pond, we say, uh, from Clearwater to Tampa. So it's not that we can't do it, it's just where does it fit in my practice and, and am I the best guy to do it? So um, I don't think we're seeing that much revision, you know, above. Yes, I do it, no doubt. Well, I, I, I was wondering if some of it may have something to do with uh, when you were saying you had that monster BMI 33. We, we looked at our one and two levels. I think it was 320 patient, consecutive patients, and our average BMI was 34. Yeah. <laughs> average. So he, Well, he was that guy that just carried it yeah. here. So, you know, you're like, wow. Man, that patient at 33, that's nothing. I'm, I'll do I that. Know. I'll walk into that OR going, yay. Florida's an awful place <laughs> so, to live and practice, though. Don't, that's right. It's okay. You don't need to move. <laughs> Question. Uh, I'll, I'll try to make this brief since I know that we're – uh, trying to move on to this next thing, but coming from an industry perspective, there's a lot of different things that we've been talking about today from A-lift, O-lift, and lateral, some of the complications that you can see, uh, when to do it. One of the things that we're competing with uh, aggressively right now is prone lateral. I haven't heard anybody talk about it today. I'd love to get the opinion of this panel on what you're seeing. I know Dr. Davidson's seeing it a lot from, from the fellow that SIG trained. Um, is there a role for that? And is this something that maybe Camber and IMSU should be looking into in the future? Or is this a fad? Uh, I'd love to get what you guys think on that. I'll start with a quick comment. I'm actually getting ready to, to do a first prone lateral probably in the next few weeks, um, looking for the right patient. Because again, like everything else, your first patient needs to be that perfect 3-4, BMI less than 30 you know, uh, type of patient because I, I don't want to have other complications. But be, that is it said, I actually think that it has potentially more promise than the lateral. I'd be interested to see what John wants to think, say about that because you have the patient in alignment. Uh, it's, um, it's more like we're traditionally seeing them. Uh, and um, so I don't know. I, I, I think it does have a future. Uh, I don't think it is a fad uh, any more than OLIF is a fad. I think OLIF is here to stay. And I think once established and you get the techniques established, I think it'll be here to stay. Well, you remember XLIF was a fad, too. Yeah, and, and in fact. And, and lateral approach is here to stay. Uh, you, my, my, Seth, my first response to that would be why? Um, I mean, if, if, if you can show me an anatomic reason that it makes sense. Now, I'm blessed with an OR crew that I can do a lateral and be, plus I'm old, I have to go to the bathroom. So I can do a, be a lateral, my nurse is closing, I'm getting a snack, and, and they're they're rolled over ready. You can to sit. The there you go. You're getting older. You can sit I, doing I, that. I, I sit a lot lateral. during my surgeries, but thank you for pointing that out that I'm the oldest guy here. But I I don't envision ever doing that just because I if it I, I don't see the why. Um, you know, when you break them on the table, you get the disc space opened up. Um, it corrects coronal pain imbalance honestly better than I think any approach does. Um, you can't do it at five one. I did do two. We won't talk about why I don't do them anymore. It was transient, but it's, it's, it was idiotic. It was a low crest, and I thought, hey, I can get there. Um, and I did, and, the, and they eventually did well. But I, I don't know. Let me know how it works out. Um, I'll yeah. try anything new because that's what keeps me from getting old. So. John, what are your thoughts about that? I agree a little bit about Jim. I don't see the upside right now. And, and, and it, it is compelling to think, okay, the, 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 the advantage of using gravity to reestablish your sagittal balance in the degenerative spine, there may be some upside there. Um, I don't think there's an upside to say, okay, no, I think this is a good idea because people are used to the patient being prone. That's not a good enough idea to me or good enough reason to learn prone lateral. And the whole reason why entered to the psoas treatment was developed in the first place was the holy grail getting to l5s1 you know i drank the kool-aid initially on this and X, I did for 10 years did x lifts love x lift surgery but we're we're taught as x lift surgeons to ignore l5s1 pathology and frankly that's just not right that's just not not right so now when those same guys want to evolve transo surgery from a lateral position to a prone position, I'm trying to figure out what is the upside? What's the advantage? Is it just moving from a, a Chevy to a Buick or is there really an advantage? Uh, John, you've taken the course. Do you, what, what is, 
Or is anybody in the room a, 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 a prone trans soloist player? Grab the mic there. But what, can, can someone just tell me what, what, what do you view as the upsides of doing a prone lateral? Well, I, 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 I operate with Lewis on this, and um, you can't get to 5 1. Um, the guys who are doing it will just do a T lift or something at 5 1 if they have to address it. Um, I think even though, I think I worry a lot about four or five and the the, uh, the nerves there in that position. Um, I don't know what their data is. Um, when I did it with him, I I, I decided right then I wasn't going to do it. Um, and then we can navigate in the in the uh, lateral position with the arm. And so if your worry is, you know, putting screws in uh, in the oblique, when you're in the lateral decubitus position, I think we can get around that now. Um, so even, you know, it can be cumbersome uh, doing single position, particularly on the right side, putting screws in. But if you're navigating, you can just roll the patient over and it's very comfortable to, to uh, navigate screws in that way. And I think with the newer, uh, navigation coming up, you know, I think we'll be navigating front and back. And then to your point about getting bicortical or the, uh, the, the chondral ring with an OLIF implant, if navigating, we're going to be able to see it a lot better than under fluoro. And we'll have the implants were already designed to, to capture the peripheral end plate. It's just that under fluoro, you're not sure where it is sometimes in regard to the contralateral foramen. And you, you're always a little worried about pushing something right into the framing. So I think that'll get better with some of the uh, AR stuff. Just one comment about four or five. Um, the, I have had transient quad weakness. Um, interestingly, my hip flexor weakness is much more common the higher up I go. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the two, three, when you're in that no man's land of diaphragm and psoas, I found that that actual insertion is more important even though the, the psoas is thinner. But as far as, as what I look at it now, if the iliac crest is below the disc space, which doesn't happen very often in just a plain standing radiograph, I will still go lateral. But if I need to fuse four, five, and five, one, I just fuse them anteriorly. Um, I don't find very often you have that lateral esthesis or the horrible curvature at four, five, and five, one. What I want to do at those two levels is get a foundation. Then at the other levels, I go in laterally. So I do a lot less, four, well, I do a lot less lateral now because I do more anteriorly. But, but um, I don't think four, five needs to scare us. We just need to pay attention to our monitoring and know what's going on down there. And I've had to abort two in the last 15 years. Um, I opened it up and actually they opened it up and looked at the psoas and, and I can't get that nerve mobilized safely. You know, the nerve inside the thecal sac is very forgiving. It is not forgiving once it's past that ganglion, so I don't mess with it. That's actually a good point. Well, um, I think John uh, said it well earlier. He said, you know, use uh, the best surgery that you do th th well, uh, do the surgery that you do well, and that really, you know, so for all the panelists here, again, um, T-lifts in your hands uh, works well, Byron, and, and uh, you have great results. Um, you know, if something's, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, but, uh, you know, other people that are pushing the envelope, like, John here, I mean, that's, that's great. So I think that uh, it's really exciting. I think it's exciting for industry, it's exciting for surgeons um, as we develop these techniques. But as John uh, said over here, uh, we gotta have data, you know, and the data's gotta show that these are worthwhile. So great session. Um, thank you all for uh, 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 presenting.